Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time again today to join the podcast. I am so excited today to have Susan Snow. Susan is the daughter of a slain LAPD detective, Thomas C. Williams, who was ambushed and killed on October 31st, 1985. And she was only 17 at the time. And she's a published author, a speaker, and a coach. And she currently works as a realtor in the Denver metro area. And, you know, just talking to you this little bit before the podcast, you know, I think that your message is going to be so important for the people that are listening. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you for having me. I'm really grateful to be here. It's been it's just, it's been wonderful to be able to meet people like you and to get this message out. And so I want to start with your story, just, just how you got to doing what you do now. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, a it's question. been a, it's a huge, <laughs> um, it has been a journey. That's for sure. Starting at 17. And it's, it's been a journey of, of just learning about mental health, and just learning about myself as well. I wasn't on this journey alone. You know, I had a boyfriend when it happened, and I'm now married to him. And we're about to celebrate 39 years together, which is nuts to me. But we basically grew up together. Mm -hmm. Uh, But going back to my story, so I grew up a cop's daughter. And you know, as I was younger, my dad was on the streets, you know, he was a street cop and he worked his way up. And as I was in my teens, he was a detective, a robbery homicide detective. And the day that we lost him, he had testified in a case that he was the lead detective on. And The perpetrator was on bail um, at the time of his trial. And so it gave him an opportunity. So what happened was this was Halloween day and I was your typical teenage girl, right? I was going to go to a party that night with my boyfriend and my friends. And the problem was it was a Thursday night and dad said, absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because that's the other side of being a cop's daughter. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, you're not going, it's a school night, you know, no. But I was bound and determined. I was a bound and determined child. So that day I had this whole plan, you know, when when my parents came home, I was going to like persuade them lovingly <laughs> yeah. to allow me to go to this party. And my mom was actually the first person to come home. My dad was picking up my then six-year-old brother from school. Mm -hmm. And my mom came home and she was still in her costume. And she went into the bathroom, started getting her costume on. And I went into my room in the, you know, in the hopes I was laying out my costume and the phone rang. So I ran out of my room because, you know, when you're a teenager, nobody calls your parents. It's always for you, right? Mm -hmm. So I ran across the room and picked up the phone and it wasn't for me. It was a lady from my brother's school. And all she said to me was that there was a drive-by shooting and my dad was involved. And... Immediately, I saw my mom kind of round the corner and I handed her the phone. And as I was watching her talk to this lady, I watched her posture completely change. And she just started to slump forward. And as soon as I saw that, I knew it was bad. Mm -hmm. She proceeded to get off the phone and looked at me and said, we're going to the school. So we grabbed our stuff and we went out to the car and got in the car. It was about a 10 minute drive. And it was the longest 10 minutes of my life because Mm -hmm. I didn't know what we were going to happen upon. And I was just, I had a pit in my stomach. I just, 
I knew it was bad. I just had this pit and my mom and I didn't speak two words to each other in the car. Mm -hmm. So when we got there, the way that the school is set up is there's a parking lot that sits in the middle of the school. And so you have the front of the school, the parking lot and the back of the school. Well, the kids and the after school care, and this was about five o'clock in the afternoon, you know, five forty, almost six o'clock at night, were let out on the back side of the school. So as we got out of the car, that's where we headed. And as we started to walk towards the back of the school, we saw police officers coming towards us and they had tears in their eyes, but they wouldn't look at us. And we kept walking and it was kind of chilly that night. I could feel the chill in the air. And I saw the sky lights, the sky was lit up by all the police cars. And there was an ambulance sitting there still in the street and wasn't moving. And as we rounded the corner, we caught the eye, uh, caught the glimpse of my dad's truck. So we started to run towards the truck. Mm -hmm. And then as we got closer, we saw there was glass all over the floor, all over the ground. And as we got closer, there he was. Mm -hmm. And he had a white sheet over him. And I could hear my mom screaming and I was standing in the street and I was not able to comprehend what I was seeing. Like it was not, the thought of him being gone was not there. Mm -hmm. I hyper-focused on that ambulance because I was like, there's an ambulance, but why aren't they helping him? Mm -hmm. That was my mindset. And quickly, a couple of uh, police officers grabbed both of us and like took us away from the scene. And they took us to an office inside the school. And at that point, I had no idea where my brother was. I didn't know if he was hurt. I didn't know where he was. I didn't know anything. And I sat in the chair. My mom got kind of taken aside. It was a very chaotic environment. And I was just sitting in that chair, just trying to wrap my head up around what, what I saw is this real, like you just go through all of these emotions and being a kid too. Like I didn't know how to process any of this. Mm -hmm. And there were two ladies that were in the office and they were talking to one another and I overheard their conversation. And in the conversation, the one lady said, that Mr. Williams was deceased. And that's when my world cracked. Mm -hmm. I, everything in my being wanted to run out of that room. I wanted to run, 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 and just keep running away from this nightmare. But my legs felt like cement. I, I could not physically move out of that chair. My body was not allowing it to happen. And then soon after that, my mom came in and she said, I'm sending you with a neighbor. And I didn't, you know, even though I wanted to run out of that room, I still, I was a kid and I wanted and needed to be with my family unit. I needed to be with my brother. I needed to be with my mother. I needed to have an adult tell me that this was going to be okay. Like, that I needed that, but I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. And I was sent to the neighbor's house where I had to try to navigate all of these emotions that I was feeling. And the poor neighbor had known my parents forever. So she was trying to wrap her head around what was happening. And it was traumatic to her as well. And so she did the best that she could, you know, with just trying to be there for me. But at the time I had been dating my boyfriend for three months and I just wanted him. I, I needed my boyfriend. So I had the neighbor call and she didn't give him very much information. 
he was at work and he was 19 at the time and I was 17 and he showed up at the door just expecting to take me to the hospital. And he kept asking me, okay, get your, get your stuff, get your jacket. Let's go. What hospital is he in? Where's your mom? Like all these questions and, and the words and anyone who has had something this traumatic happen, know this feeling. You can't say it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say it. If I said it, it was real. And part of me didn't want to acknowledge that. So it took me a while of him prodding me to go. And I finally just blurted it out. He's not at a hospital. He's gone. And it was the first time I saw my, my husband, boyfriend back then, drop to his knees. Hmm. And we spent the rest of the night just trying to figure out what was next how we were going to navigate this, you know, mm -hmm. he knew that he needed to be there for me. I mean, most 19 year old boys would have said, bye-bye. Yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> this is too much. This yeah. is way too much. And when I say chaos, like there was a lot of chaos around this. So all of a sudden my quiet neighborhood became this craziness of police cars everywhere. Um, we heard helicopters over head, the media showed up. I mean, you name it. This was the first time a Los Angeles policeman, especially a detective had ever been assassinated and they didn't find the, the people involved right away. And so my world just completely changed overnight within hours. I went from being a normal teenager, getting ready to go to a party with friends and, you know, manipulate my dad to let me go. And to this kid who at that point, I felt like I lost everything. I didn't have a really healthy relationship with my mother prior to this happening. And dad was kind of that go between that voice of reason. He was an extraordinary father. The one thing I could say about my dad is that he was present and he was the type of person that when he was with you, he made you feel like you were the most important person. So he was very, very present, whether it was at work, with colleagues, with friends, with his wife, with his children, he was present. And he was also my safety net. And that was all gone. So not only did I have to navigate his loss and how he died, but I also had to navigate the idea that now I was going to have to figure this out with the other parent who just sent me away. And that was really hard on a kid, you know, and there was, there was no time. I mean, this is the eighties. And if you remember the eighties, there was no talk about mental health. Mm. There was little known about PTSD. In fact, back then it was called shell shock. Mm. And there definitely weren't any resources for kids. At the time, I don't even think LAPD had anything in place, advocacy for children of murdered officers or officers killed in the line of duty. So they had stuff for the wife, you know, or the husband, but the children, it was different. So it was a matter of me just trying to figure out how to deal with what was happening to me. And what was happening to me initially was I was like, I walked around in a fog and I didn't sleep. I got no rest. There were people in my house constantly that night and after that night. And I hid in my room with my boyfriend, but during the day, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to leave my room. I didn't want to do anything. The depression was so severe. 
At the time, I didn't know that I had suicidal ideation, but I did. And anxiety through the roof. I had panic attacks over and over every single day just because my safety net was gone and I didn't feel safe. Even though I had 20 officers in the front yard and 20 in the backyard, I still didn't feel safe. I had bodyguards that went with me anywhere I had to go. It was just a world that you just can't wrap your head around. You know, with my mom kind of turtling into herself and all the focus, and so be it, all the focus was on my brother because the thing that my dad did, the last thing he did on this earth was to save his life. Um, by telling him to duck down in the truck, he knew it was coming. And so obviously all of that focus would be on my mom and my brother. And I was kind of pushed to the side. The media took a couple of days to figure out he had a teenage daughter. So my mindset at the time was that when my mom sent me away, so I didn't feel important in this scenario. All the focus was on my brother and my mother. And so that made me feel like I wasn't important in this scenario. And I had 17 years with the man. He was my best friend mm -hmm. and he was my hero. So that was really hard to deal with at the time being a kid. And about a month after my dad was killed, LAPD came to us and said, we want to pay for you to see therapy, to seek therapy. And at the time, I just did what people told me to do. Like you just put me in a direction and move me that way. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So when my mom came to me and said, you know, LAPD says we should go to therapy. Now, first of all, I thought if you went to a therapist, you know, as a kid, I said, if you went to a therapist, you must be crazy. Like that was my mindset. Only crazy people go to therapy. But, you know, like I said, I did what people told me to do. So when my mom said, you're going to a therapist, I went. In the back of my head, I felt, okay, well, maybe this is the adult. Maybe this is the person that's going to help me to feel better, to like come out of this ickiness that I'm feeling, to teach me how to sleep again, like something, <laughs> anybody. I was so disappointed because, I mean, I think in, in hindsight, I don't think that he was educated or prepared enough to handle my amount of trauma. So because of that, he kept our sessions very general and I say sterile, like there were no, he never asked me about the emotions I felt around seeing my dad having that trauma. He stuck with, you know, my relationship with my mother, my brother, my boyfriend, and school. And that was every session. And every session I, I kept saying to myself, today's the day. Today's the day he's going to figure this out. He's going to figure it out and I'm going to get better. And I had that conversation with me for an entire year. My final session with him, he looked at me and said, Susan, you're a well-rounded young lady and you're going to be fine for the rest of your life. And I don't need to see you anymore. And I thought, wait a minute, I have all this stuff that I'm dealing with. How can I be fine? Like, so then my mindset shifted and said, Susan, you must have just cracked. Like, you're just crazy. And this is just something you're going to deal with for the rest of your life. So I guess you're going to have to figure this out yourself because even a professional can't help you. So I just reserved my brain to say, okay, well, I guess you're just going to live like this. This is just, which was flight or flight. Like this is just how I, it's going to be. And I did that for 14 years. Mm -hmm. I got really good at wearing my emotional mask. And what that was for me was people would tell me things like, oh, Susan, you're so brave. You're so strong. You're going to be fine. You're resilient. Kids bounce back. You know, I heard it all. And that's what I wore. I wore it. So every time something other 
then that trauma happened, another trauma happened, I would put that mask on and be like, I'm fine. I'm strong. This isn't affecting me. And I lived like that, which is, by the way, not the way to live. <laughs> not not recommended. Not recommended. Um, and yet so many people have been through that. Yeah. 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 Not not recommended. Um, and, you know, I got married young. I married that boyfriend. He was 24 and I was 21. But, you know, that was the next step. Uh, back then we had been dating for a while and that was the next step. We just did what we were expected to do. But neither of us had dealt with our trauma. <laughs> mm. And I had kids, I had two children, and I vowed that I was not going to be the same parent as I grew up with, with my mom. And that was important to me. I never wanted my children to feel like I felt that day or needing help in that way or not fe feeling like they're on an island by themselves. I never, ever wanted my children to feel that way. I always wanted my children to know that I was 100%. I wanted to be the parent that my dad was to me, was being present. But that's really hard when you're dealing with PTSD and you're busy wearing your emotional mask. You're not able to do that. You know, you're not able to give people 100% of you, no matter how hard you try right? Without the work being done yourself, within yourself. So my husband and I relocated from Southern California. We drove, we uh, relocated to Colorado. And at the time when we moved here, I was working pretty close to Littleton, Colorado. We moved here in 97, April of 97. And in April 20th, of 1999, I was working as a hairdresser at a salon and took a break, went into my back room and turned on our tiny little TV. And on there was the coverage of the Columbine school shootings. And I had a visceral reaction. I started to have flashbacks. I saw the school I saw the police officers, I saw the ambulance and it proceeded into a panic attack. I turned pale white. My coworkers had no idea what was going on with me because at the time I never told them my story. Mm. And so, and I, you know, they kept asking me, what is wrong with you? Like, you don't live by that area and you certainly are not old enough to have kids at that school. So what is going on with you? And I couldn't answer them. I was like, I have no idea what's happening to me right now. I, I, I have no idea. Because remember, I was told I was going to be fine for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So I did what I normally do. I put that emotional mask on and I finished my day. And everybody around me was upset, clearly upset. But I kept saying to myself, this isn't going to affect me. This isn't affecting me. I'm strong. I'm, you know, I'm brave. I'm whatever. And I went about my day. And then as soon as I walked through those doors to go home, all of it came flooding back. All of it the anxiousness, the depression, the hopelessness. I felt like I was spiraling and it's, it continued to get worse. Um, at, and I had suicidal ideation. I had plans. I had, you know, I, I went from, I can't, I, I, I can't, I got to stop this pain to I can't leave my children. I can't do this to my kids. And my husband being a smart man, he saw it and he knew it was a slippery slope and it scared him. 
So he met me at the door one day and he said, Susan, you have two choices. You either get help right now or I'm going to put you in a hospital. And I, you know, I, I was scared and I said, okay, I'll go get help. I'll do it. And so I went to a regular physician and I told him what was going on and he immediately put me on antidepressants because that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And then he handed me a card and he said, I want you to make an appointment with a therapist. <laughs> and I, I laughed at him. I literally laughed at him because I was like, wait a minute, like 14 years ago, I saw therapy and it didn't do anything for me. What makes you think that it's going to happen? And he looked at me and he said, you have no choice. You have no choice. So I was like, all right, you know, and something in me said, okay, let's just do it. Let's just try it. Let's, you know, I have everything to lose if I don't. And I met with her and within the first three minutes of our conversation, I knew something was different and she specialized in severe trauma she knew all about PTSD. And the first thing she said to me after I explained what I had gone through at 17 and what I was currently dealing with, she looked me in the eyes and she said, Susan, everything that you have gone through since you were 17 years old is normal because you have PTSD. And what you need to understand about PTSD is that it doesn't go away. You learn to manage it. And I couldn't believe it. I, I was like, you mean I'm not crazy? But here's the thing. How can I have PTSD? I didn't go to war. Mm -hmm. I'm not in the military. And she said, but anyone who has gone through trauma can have PTSD. But like I said, it doesn't go away because it's an actual trauma to your brain. You just learn to manage it. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. This woman is going to help me. Finally, after all these years, I found someone I felt like I could be 100% vulnerable with and that she was going to lead me on this healing journey. And there was just so much hope in it. I, I describe it as the sky opened up and rainbow shot out because that's how it felt. It felt like for the first time in 14 years, I was actually going to be able to heal. And at the time, I was not sleeping. I had not slept in days and having kids, small kids, and not sleeping is not a good mix no. for your mental health. No. And she asked me, she said, you know, why is it you're not sleeping? You know, and I said, because every time I shut my eyes, I go back to that night or I go back to that feeling. Um, and so I get anxious prior to even going to bed, like knowing it's nighttime starts me. And I talk a lot, I talk to a lot of people who have this happen to them. And she said, okay, well, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. We're going to try something. And she knew she had her work cut out with me because <laughs> 14 years of living in fight or flight, like there is a lot of stuff to break down. Right. So mm -hmm. This was the first thing she tackled. And she said, um, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. I'm going to ask you to journal everything out of your head before you go to bed. And you can journal by writing. You can do it in art. You can do it with music. Whatever you feel comfortable doing, that's how I want you to do it. And I kind of looked at her like, are you kidding me? Like, really? <laughs> like, I, I felt like it was so you know, law, law, right. It was just out there, whatever. But 
I was like, all right, fine. I'll, I'll try it. I'm, I write. So I'm just, I'll just write, you know? And she said, okay, well get yourself a pad of paper or journal or something and put it by your bed, put it, you know, and, and like, if you have to set an alarm to remind yourself or whatever you need to do, right. To journal. And then I want you to just write. And the first day, like the first couple of days, <laughs> When I write, I'm like, oh, I didn't spell that right. And I didn't, you know, this punctuation was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even a teacher. No. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's what I did. And I'd call her and I'd be like, hey, this is driving me nuts. And she said, no, no, Susan, this is not an English course. Like you just write. And it doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. It doesn't matter. Just get it out of your head. So I did that for an entire week before our next session. And when I came back, she said, okay, so, you know, what was your, what were your feelings about it? You know, and did it help and whatever. And I told her, I said, after two nights of doing it, I started sleeping because I was able to get all of it out of my head and then go to sleep. And I was able to rest, you know, my nervous system was not all, you know, crazy. And so, you know, that's the one thing I teach people is like, if you're hypersensitive at night, find a way to journal it out of your brain because it does help. Now, does it work for everybody? Probably not. But there are so many different modalities out there. You just got to find one that works for you. There's no one size fits all in healing. So you've got to find, you know, something that works for you. And initially, you know, first of all, with someone who was getting back into therapy, who didn't, who was still on the fence about it, she wasn't going to go full force with me. You know what I mean? She was not going to dive in right away. It was working through something, baby steps, just taking that little baby step and then working me towards the more intense healing modalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned a couple of things there. The fact that you need to find the right therapist and not to say that any therapist is good or bad, but they have, you have to have a connection with them somehow. You have to resonate with them, right? And, totally. and so I always, you know, this is good encouragement for people. I mean, just because you went to one coach therapist and it didn't work out doesn't mean there isn't one out there for you that's going to make a huge difference, well, and I, I tell people this, if you are not, you'll know within the first three minutes, like yeah. I hear people, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people and they say things like, oh, therapy didn't work for me. Well, it didn't work for you because you weren't aligned with the right person, right? Mm -hmm. You weren't feeling heard. You weren't feeling uh, safe. And that's important. What you need to remember if you're in this situation and you're trying to heal is that this is your journey. It's not theirs. So the investment in finding the right therapist is really important because it is your journey. And you do want to make sure that that person is not just trauma informed, that they're trauma competent, meaning that they understand your type of trauma and they're able to find the modalities and find the ways to help you and guide you in your healing. And if you don't have that, it is, you know, interview. I tell people like interview your therapist. Yeah. Because that's the best way you're going to know if they are trauma competent. Like I said, you'll know if you have a connection. If you don't have a connection enough where you can be 100% vulnerable with that person, your healing isn't going to happen. It's just not. It's going to take a lot longer and it's going to be a lot more frustration for you. So it's important that you make that investment in yourself in finding the right therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. 
And so obviously that was a big turning point for you. And since then you've written a book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about what, what's the book about? Oh my gosh. So my book stemmed from, I knew that at some point I would write a book. I just didn't know what time, when, right? When I was 50 years old, I drew a line in the sand and I said, that's it. I got to get this thing done. Not just for myself. Like I knew that the book would be cathartic for myself, but also what I wanted was to be able to help my brother in some way. You know, he's been through it. And he chose the same road my mom did with addiction. Um, And he's fantastic now, but it's been a long journey for him as well. But I wanted to somehow, through my own story and my own experiences, help give him hope for his own healing. And there were a lot... I was recognizing there were a lot of people walking around with trauma that just didn't know where to start. And I wanted to show them my story so that I could encourage them to start their healing journey and that there was resiliency on the other side and freedom from the pain. So when I started this journey, it was terrifying. It took me four and a half years to write my book. And the reason it did is because I had to dive and relive and feel all of the emotions and be a hundred percent raw and authentic. But there were a f- there were fears behind it too. The first fear was that it was going to blow up my relation, what was left of my relationship with my mother, because in telling my story and in telling my truth, I had to tell hers. And what I didn't know then, and I do know now, is that she's got a narcissistic personality. So I had to be okay with it would either open a conversation with my mother and help our relationship heal, or it was going to blow it up. And she was not going to accept my story and only see the negative parts of her, like I was talking about her, which I didn't vilify her in my book at all. Um, But I had to be authentic and I had to tell my full story. So it did blow up the relationship, but um, there are times I talk about my husband in there and some things we've gone through as a couple. And so there was fear of blowing that back up. And, and then there was my safety. You know, there was this little thing in the back of my head where I thought, oh my gosh, me putting my story out there leaves me out there in the wind. And will these men that were involved, because there was multiple men involved in my dad's killing, would they come after me? Would there be retaliation? What I had to do is dig deep and find my North Star, find my purpose. And my purpose were the people, the people out there that needed to hear my story to see that you can go through terrible things in your life, but you can also heal from them and you can find resiliency. And... Every time those fears would come floating back to me, that's what I would picture is those faces of those people out there and wanting to give them hope and let them understand that you're, they're not alone and that all the things that they've been feeling and going through, they're not crazy and that they can manage these things that are going on with them, they can find those ways, but they have to do the work. And I did the work and continue to do the work. And so I feel like, you know, I joke with friends and say, it's almost like my, and if you don't know what this is, you might not be old enough, you're listening, but the cliff notes. Oh, yes. (laughs) 
<laughs> the cliff notes to healing, right? Um, I feel like when I got to that point in my life, I just, I knew that it was important and that, you know, I felt like my dad was kicking me in the rear end to get this thing done and get my message out. I felt like that my purpose was in his death and as his purpose for himself was in his death as well, because there have been a lot of really good things that have come out of learning from his death. So that was my intention. Mm -hmm. And now my intention is to get on as many stages and give this message to as many people as I can get on, get out there. And if I can help one person in that audience heal, then I've done my job. Beautiful. Beautiful. And so, you know, this is an amazing story. It's an amazing story of resilience and, and how you've taken something. And like you're saying, you've learned so much through this process, even though it was very traumatic, you've learned so much and you are helping people. And so tell people where they can find you in case they want to hear more. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So funny, you should say that. <laughs> I am actually, I'm on Instagram. It's my name. It's Susan underscore snow one. I'm getting on TikTok folks. <laughs> As of today, I will be doing TikTok videos, telling my story in hopes to really get my message out. So you can find me on my name as my name on TikTok. My hair looks a little different. I'm a little darker. Uh, <laughs> I have bangs, but I am going to be doing that. I do have a website. It's susansnowspeaks.com that has information on my book. It has information on my speaking. And it also has a way if you want to, you can obviously get a hold of me and I'll message me on Instagram. I am open to speaking to anyone who needs an ear. And you can do it through my website as well. My book is on Amazon right now, and it is available on paperback. Or if you are a Kindle person, you can read it on Kindle. If you're a Kindle Unlimited, you can actually read it for free. And all I ask for is a review. So there's various ways that you can get a hold of me. And like I said, I am open to speaking to anyone. If you're out there and you're listening and you feel like, you resonate with some of the things that I was saying, feel free to contact me. Beautiful. Thank you again so much for taking the time. And I'm really encouraging people to go check out your Instagram and your website and TikTok if you're on TikTok. And, and, and um, yeah. My books, the, I didn't even say the name of my book. Oh, yes. Me. <laughs> the name of my book is The Other Side of the Gun. My trauma, my journey from trauma to resiliency. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's so powerful. Yeah. And it's going to be a powerful story to read. So, yeah. Thank you so much for what you do. And thank you for taking the time. And I want to thank everyone for watching and have a great day. Thank you so much.